The sage Pei Tang Ho ended his five-year trance on sacred Mount Kung. When life returned to his eyes, the acolytes kowtowed and then quickly introduced their brushes, inks, and writing papers. The grandmasters of the various schools within the world of martial arts would know his answer to their question as soon as the messengers could carry them to the twelve provinces. The sage stretched his arms and legs, rubbed his bald head, and then spoke. The Chen dynasty is in decline. The reign of the previous emperor was a disaster. The people cannot cope with bandits, plagues, monsters from hell, oppressive taxation, the list goes on. The Grand Masters wish to know what can be done. I have their answer. Pei Tang Ho paused long enough to let the scribes copy down his words. There is nothing the Grand Masters can do. For the future of the Empire rests not with them. Tiger, Dragon, Turtle, Phoenix, and Unicorn must pool their might. The Sha, despised as many as reckless and harmful to society, are the key. A new generation of Grand Masters must rise from their ranks and lead the new order. For good or ill, the future is in their hands. One year later, the Grand Masters are putting their plans into action. Some seek to restore the Chen Dynasty, some to bring it down, others to simply persevere. But all seek talented Sha to train and become the next generation of which Pei Tang Ho spoke. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildred, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. It's been a while since we covered a wuxia game, isn't it? Not since Keen three years ago. Once upon a time, there was a game called Dragon Fist. Chris Parmas's wuxia-inspired span on AD&D, which is in an awkward position where Wizards of the Coast had put it on their website, but didn't outright sell it. It was available as a set of PDFs for free. At least until Wizards reformatted their website again. Unfortunately, folks like Stargazer's World have mirrored it elsewhere. Given the OSR movement's attempts to put new spins on old-school D&D, it was only a matter of time before someone took a crack at it. And thus we arrive at today's subject, Flying Swordsman, a spiritual successor brought to us by Dennis Laffey that puts an OSR spin on the old Dragon Fist. How does it hold up? Let's find out. Being an OSR game, Flying Swordsman is going to be mostly familiar to those who have cut their teeth on AD&D. This will be not too far off with the sample character we'll be making, a young swordsman named Feng Zhan Li. The first step is ability scores, which are in the same spread as in other OSR games. Much like them, we roll 46 for each score and we drop the lowest die. After making the rolls, we get the following results. Strength 18, Intelligence 16, Wisdom 14, Dexterity 15, Constitution 17, and Charisma 11. Normally, this would determine the modifiers for each ability, but Flying Swordsman instead uses Stunt Die based on the score. Each Stunt Die mirrors an ability score, so Might for Strength, Savvy for Intelligence, and so on. Checking the chart on the matter, Feng Zhan has the following Stunt Die. Might D6, Savvy D4, Insight D4, Acrobatics D3, Fortitude D4, and Charm D2. Second is choosing the class and, optionally, Profile. The primary classes are Fighter, Wizard, Shaman, and Thief. Profiles are specializations of the classes that offer certain benefits if you meet their requirements. Given the Swordsman concept here, we'll be going with the Fighter class and the Weapon Master profile. Being a Fighter grants us plus 2 to hit and plus 3 to hit with specialized weapons, in this case Straight Swords, as well as plus 2 damage with the specialized weapon, again with Straight Swords, and as a Weapon Master, we gain two more benefits. Once per day, we can inflict double damage, and we gain a plus two bonus to armor class against straight sword attacks. Third, Martial Arts Maneuvers and Magic, which contribute to creating your martial arts style. The latter doesn't necessarily apply since Lee doesn't use magic, but he does gain two first level maneuvers, in this case Little Whirlwind and Tiger Vault. Fourth, we determine the derived values. Hit points at first level are your maxed hit die, in this case d12, and adding the fortitude die, in this case totaling 14 HP. Armor class's base is 10 for every character. Finally, saving throws are spread as follows. Wood 14, fire 17, earth 17, metal 16, and water 16. Finally, we have the starting equipment and money, based on either the class and profile, or both. As a weapon master, Lee has his trusty straight sword and 21 tile to spend. We'll be spending that on fine clothing, 
five days of preserved food, and a wineskin, leaving us with only one tile. Character creation is pretty familiar if you've played at least one OSR game. If I have one little nitpick, it's the restriction on martial arts maneuvers when using profiles. Maybe it's just me, but I feel they go a bit too far towards acting like a drawback to the profile's benefits. If you'll excuse me putting on my own design hat, I'd rather prefer rewarding to sticking to a style rather than restricting. Once again, if you've played an OSR game before, you'll be familiar with most of the mechanics. Initiative is based on your action speed instead of being preset, and die rolls consist of a d20 roll plus or minus your stunt die based on the ability used. Magic-wise, the two spellcasters use the stunt die differently. Shamans prepare their spells in advance, but may roll the insight stunt die to gain extra spells prepared. This is done on a 2 to 1 format where you need to have at least two bonus spells of a lower level to get a bonus spell of the next level, if a shaman wishes to. In other words, a shaman who rolled a 3 can get two bonus first level spells and one second level spell, or three first level spells. Wizards, on the other hand, do not have to prepare in advance. Instead, utilizing a set of spell slots based on their level that they can be used on any spell that they know, which is also, of course, based on those slots. Wizards with a profile can use a stunt die to gain bonus spell slots, but this does not add to the spells you know. The determining factor here is going to be the stunt system, since it is key to a lot of the mechanics, making each action not as much of a guarantee. It might be considered too random for some, but it's an admirable way to introduce a degree of dynamism to the encounters and mechanics. Flying Swordsman does exactly what it says on the tin. It's a successor to Dragon Fist that brings it more in line with the stylings of the OSR. This, for me, is a double-edged sword. You see, many times over the years I've heard the argument of just reskin it in regard to making mechanics and settings outside the norm with D&D. I'm not the biggest fan of this mindset, and I never have been, since even with all the name-changing and the like, it's still the same thing at its core. To put it a bit more harshly, if you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. I am fully aware of my own biases, but I feel like D&D in general is ultimately too rooted in its pastiches to work in other genres without significantly overhauling it. And by overhaul, I mean blow it up. Flying Swordsman does an excellent job at attempting to blend Wuxia and AD&D, but there's still the DNA there that struggles. As I mentioned before, I'm not completely fond of martial arts maneuvers being preset on the first three levels in Profiles, and the spellcasting classes still feel too much like their D&D counterparts but I suspect taking it a bit further would have disrupted its OSR compatibility. On a positive note, as I mentioned before, I adore the potential the stunt system gives to make die rolls more descriptive and not as dependent on just the d20. I personally think it doesn't go as far as it should, but the potential is there nonetheless. Even with all this, while the game is a net positive, the highest rating I can give the game is playable. It definitely does what it says on the tin, but I feel like it doesn't quite reach its potential. Comparing it to the other OSR games I've reviewed at this point, I would say it's around the same tier as Hyperborea, but not on the same level as Adventure Conqueror King. While I'm not quite sure if AD&D is the best framework for this style of fantasy, that doesn't make Flying Swordsman any less of a quality work.